Okay, I think that we can get started. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the disaggregation by global ecosystem typology, which will, is being proposed by the ATEG for use across the, the monitoring framework. So the idea would be to use this disaggregation in order to capture uh, information on ecosystem functional group or ecosystem type for the many different geospatial indicators that are in the in the monitoring framework. Um, this is part of a series of webinars. We'll put the link to where the webinars are in the chat so that you are welcome to attend other webinars that are on other indicators. For instance, the one on restoration, which is was yesterday, is also proposing to disaggregate by the global ecosystem typology. Um, additionally, the SAPSTA documents are available online and all of the recommendations from the ATEG are in information document 14. Um, so with that, I would like to, to say that I think, before I hand over to Emily, I think that disaggregating consistently across the different indicators in the global biodiversity uh, frameworks monitoring framework is one of the sort of game changers moving forward because this would actually provide us with a way to have consistent analysis uh, across the different aspects of the global biodiversity framework for each ecosystem. And so to me, this is, is a foundation of the, the monitoring framework because it, it's going to provide a way to actually understand what's happening on the ground with mangroves or with coral reefs or with particular types of forest. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, the, the people who are going to be talking today. I'll introduce Emily Nicholson. She is uh, a member of the ATEG on Indicators and has been very actively involved in this work. She also leads the work or co-leads the work on the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems. Um, which is also one of the indicators in the framework and is also using the global ecosystem typology. Um, there's Jana, uh, who is the director of the Group on Earth Observations. And in that, there's the Geoecosystem Atlas. The Geoecosystem Atlas is aiming to pull together uh, a set of maps at the global level that would have this sort of ecosystem typology information in it for each country and an overall global picture. Um, and then there's Michelle and Kindle who are going to be supporting the, the discussion by providing some specific examples of where this has worked um, and, and what the global or how the global ecosystem typology has been used in practice. So with that, I'll hand over to Emily. Thanks, Gillian. Um, I'll just quickly share my slides and if you can let me know if that did that work. I can't see my notes though, so that's not very good. Let's see if I can. Yeah, there we go. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about ecosystems across the global, the global biodiversity framework and Gillian for that introduction. Um, uh, this uh, webinar is going to be quite full um, as part of many of these um, webinars have been in this series on the monitoring framework. Um, I'm going to um, start with a um, mainly focusing on the importance of monitoring ecosystems in a consistent way across the, um, the, the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, um, and also introduce uh, the global ecosystem typology, which is what our tech has recommended we use um, for disaggregating ecosystem uh, based on ecosystem and consistently treating ecosystems across the typology. And then I'll um, touch on one of the key ecosystem indicators that uses the typology, which is uh, headline indicator A1, the red list of ecosystems, and give a, um, a brief introduction to that. And then we have a fantastic set of panelists um, who uh, are going to speak as well. Um, just, there we go. Um, uh, and then um, I'm hoping that um, at the end we'll have uh, time for discussion. I'll be keeping an eye on when the panelists are speaking. I'll be keeping an eye on the on, on the questions in the chat, and we'll do my best to to respond to them then, and then um, pull out some of them for for discussion at the end. Okay. So. One of the big advances of the GBF was to take an ecosystem approach across the framework. 
And this was in recognition of the essential role that ecosystems play in sustaining biodiversity, but also in sustaining us through nature's contributions to people and the ecosystem services that underpin human well-being and the economy. Uh, so this is expressed by parties setting um, goals and targets for ecosystems, most notably in goal A, which I show here, but also through goal B's emphasis on the benefits provided by natural ecosystems and multiple targets um, that, that address ecosystems, including target two on restoration, target three on protected areas and OECMs. Parties also selected headline indicators that would allow us to measure progress on the state of ecosystems, their benefits, restoration and protection. So our ability to, to set these goals, uh, targets and indicators for ecosystems is based on these really great advances over the last decade in classifying, mapping and assessing ecosystems. Uh, this includes new classification frameworks, remote sensing technologies and, and, and analysis technologies, and international standards for assessment of ecosystem change, which allow globally consistent uh, assessment. And these include the UN uh, ecosystem accounts, which we heard about in Monday's webinar, and also the ACN Red List of Ecosystems, uh, which I'll talk about today and others. So these advances also present us with an opportunity to strengthen the monitoring framework through a consistent approach to ecosystems across the GBF so that we can measure different aspects of ecosystems, their conservation and change. We can link action through the targets to outcomes in the goals. And we can also can compare ecosystems across countries if we take a consistent approach. Um, as Mandy Driver highlighted on Monday's webinar, the ecosystem related indicators should be seen as a set. Uh, these are the, the key ones, but there are a range of indicators that, that are gonna be disaggregated by ecosystems that I haven't included here that I'll mention later on. Uh, if they're reported on consistently by ecosystem type or ecosystem group, they can give us a well-rounded picture for each ecosystem type, for example, for kelp forests. Uh, uh, and so, for example, the sort of questions that we can ask are through indicator A1, is it threatened? A2 is how much of it still exists? Uh, B1 tells us which services it provides and if they're increasing or decreasing. Uh, and uh, for target two and three, we can find out how much is being restored and how much is being protected. And over time, these same indicators can help us evaluate our progress towards the goals and the effectiveness of the targets and the actions under them. And bear with me with this, um, this rather complex looking model. Um, uh, but the GBF targets, uh, one of the things that I think was really um, fantastic about the, 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 the new global biodiversity framework was that it was really structured around a theory of how uh, actions uh, on threats can achieve our goals. So here um, in blue, um, we show how the global biodiversity targets address key threatening processes and the actions um, that we need to reverse biodiversity lo loss and achieve the goals, which I've got listed here in uh, so just some of them in, in green and yellow. So these are the desired outcomes. Uh, so here I'm just looking at those that relate to ecosystems. So, so these are some of the targets and the actions that, uh, that aim to reverse loss in ecosystem area um, and integrity. Uh, and in turn, these help uh, support the species uh, that depend on the ecosystems and the sustained nature's contributions to people that come from these ecosystems. And these are monitored using these just as examples, the indicators that I've highlighted in circles here. But to be able to measure this progress, we need to uh, measure and report at an appropriate level of detail. Simply saying we have more marine protected areas or restoring more marine ecosystems won't be enough to understand uh, if these efforts are having an impact on kelp forests, uh, for example, through increases in the area indicator A2 or by their becoming less threatened through indicator A1. So we need a consistent approach to reporting on these efforts uh, so that we can understand whether they're having an impact. And Arteg has recommended that, the, that um, the method for consistent reporting is the IUCN ecosystem typology. So what is the global ecosystem typology? Uh, it, um, 
it is a, a science-based tool um, that was developed uh, in, uh, in consultation, review and restoration with over 100 ecosystem specialists and experts around the world, led by Professor David Keith at University of New South Wales. It's been adopted and recognised by several, uh, many international bodies, including most recently adoption as an international statistical standard by the UN Statistical Division, as well as um, used through um, IACN uh, and its standards. Uh, it's a, um, a hierarchical and comprehensive classification system. And I want to emphasise that it's a classification system above a, a mapping tool, uh, which really uh, makes it stand out against some of the, um, the other tools that are around here. Though I'll, we'll talk more about spatial data in a moment. So the typology includes all ecosystems, including marine, terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems in a hierarchical structure, from realms to biomes, and just over 100 ecosystem functional groups. And these ecosystem functional groups are, for example, tropical lowland rainforests, coral reefs, mangrove forests, and peat bogs. RTEG recommends reporting, global reporting is done at um, the ecosystem functional group level or level three of the typology, because this allows for harmonized global reporting and comparison that is manageable while still providing enough detail to be meaningful from a biodiversity perspective. So what do I mean by manageable? Although there's 110 ecosystem functional groups, uh, 18 of which are anthropogenic, on average countries have about 10 to 15 terrestrial ecosystem functional groups, including those anthropogenic ecosystems, uh, for example, cities and industrial areas um, or agricultural areas. Um, and in total around, on average, 20 natural ecosystem functional groups across terrestrial, uh, terrestrial freshwater and coastal groups. So although it sounds like a lot from a country by country level, it's quite a manageable number. But this still gives us meaningful information about biodiversity. Uh, and, and as I said, this is just an indication of the hierarchical nature of the, um, of the, the typology. One of the key um, features of this is it's not intended to replace national reporting. We expect that national ecosystem types should be used for planning, action, assessment and accounting. Um, uh, so this is national data, national knowledge uh, and national um, capacity and knowledge infrastructure. What we expect is that national classifications would be crosswalked to these ecosystem functional groups. Um, to allow, allow consistent global reporting. Um, decision making is still based on national data. But what it allows is the typology allows us harmonization of existing national classifications so that we can compare between countries. Um, and it's also been used to develop new ecosystem classifications. For example, in Myanmar, where it provided the conceptual structure to work with experts to identify, classify and map uh, the ecosystems that are recognised locally. Um, so just briefly, um, uh, the the you can explore the global ecosystem typology in a um, in a in a IUCN publication. But the best place to look at the most up to date versions is on this website, globalecosystems.org. <coughs> Um, and there you can explore the ecosystems of the world um, through uh, descriptions, uh, photos um, and indicative maps of their distribution of the ecosystem functional groups. And I recommend that you explore it and have a look around. It's like a world tour when you're stuck in your office. You can also, through the analyse function here, explore which ecosystem functional groups are likely to, uh, to occur in your country or your region. Uh, so I'd recommend you have a look at that as well. And just as an example to try and bring this to life a little bit, um, uh, here you can see one ecosystem functional group, um, uh, which is the uh, aparic tussock savannas, um, which have different expressions around the world on three different continents. So for example, um, we find them across the, the Southern Hemisphere and in parts of, um, of Europe, um, uh, South Asia um, and, and North America. And here are three examples from Brazil uh, in the Cerrado, Mozambique, which we'll hear a little bit more about shortly, and in an area that um, where I do my own research, 
um, with my PhD student Alice Young and others in the Tiwi Islands in Australia. So these are all savanna ecosystems. They have varying levels of trees, um, but the key feature here is grasses. They're dominated by grasses that that um, that grow in a in a wet summer season and then are consumed by frequent fly, fires. And so it's a really fire driven system. The dynamics are driven by fire. Uh, and even though these are on different continents and they've got different species that are in them, they all look similar and they behave similarly. And so this allows us to put them into an ecosystem functional group and understand them as, a, as something that's similar, that's related. Okay, so what are the implications of reporting by ecosystem functional group? The first is that parties will need ecosystem classifications and maps. And this is uh, at a national level. This is not just for the ecosystem related indicators, but really across the whole global biodiversity framework for implementation and monitoring. This is currently the biggest gap. We don't know how many countries have adequate ecosystem classification maps. Um, an inventory is currently being developed um, as part of the Geo Global Ecosystems Atlas initiative, and this is going to be a valuable resource. Our recent data um, uh, through our own research on ACN suggests that at least 60 to 100 countries may have adequate ecosystem data. But it's clear that we're going to need investment in foundational spatial data for ecosystems. And I'll come back to that at the end. But the global ecosystem typology can actually help us close this gap. So, for example, countries with um, with ecosystem classifications and maps, um, we can align these with the typology and so that we understand how they relate to, um, to ecosystems around the world and so that they can report consistently. For countries with uh, with data that is, for example, you might have different ecosystem classifications and maps that are spread across ministries and sectors, for example, information in the forestry uh, department, um, different information in the environment department. Uh, the typology can allow you to synthesize that information and identify gaps in information through aligning it or, or crosswalking with the global ecosystem typology. And for countries with no data, the typology can start as a framework for developing new e national classifications and maps. And we have examples of this from Myanmar and Malaysia um, and a project currently under with the Maldives um, where um, the, the typology has provided a structure for, for developing new information at a national level. And also um, a, a range of different partners are working to, de to develop guidelines and tools um, as well as building capacity and people um, and providing uh, uh, global and regional data to support countries uh, as they implement um, the indicators, the ecosystem related indicators. Okay, so um, that's my first introduction on the on the global ecosystem typology and, and the need for a consistent approach of across the framework. I'm now going to move on to um, headline indicator A1, the red list of ecosystems, um, and, and briefly introduce that as um, as in part of this, this series on the monitoring framework. Um, I won't pause for questions now, but I'll come back to those at the end and, and try and answer them during the, the time that the panelists are speaking. Um, okay, so, and I just, um, in case you're wondering where this place is and this ecosystem that you can see in this slide, um, this is the Tiwi Islands as well, um, off the north of Australia, um, where we work. And, uh, absolutely beautiful place. Um, okay, so the red list of ecosystems um, as a headline indicator integrates several parts, uh, addresses and integrates several parts of goal A, and it brings together information about change in area, integrity, connectivity and resilience to estimate the risk of ecosystem collapse. It's a headline indicator for goal A and for target one uh, on, on planning to halt loss in area and integrity or loss of ecosystems. Um, but it's also a component indicator for target three on protected areas and a complementary indicator for target two on restoration and target seven on pollution. And um, RTEG has also identified that disaggregations of this indicator can be used to report on target eight on the impacts of climate change on ecosystems and on target six on the impacts of invasive species. 
So um, what is the Red List of Ecosystems? You may be less familiar with the Red List of Ecosystems than its older sibling, the Red List of Threatened Species, or perhaps I should say parent or even grandparent. Uh, the Red List of Threatened Species underpins headline indicator A3, the Red List Index, and is about six years old. The Red List of Ecosystems is about 10. So the two focus on very different levels of biodiversity, and that makes them complementary to understanding biodiversity loss and the priorities for action to reverse it. So the Red List of Ecosystems was adopted by IUCN 10 years ago in 2014 as the global standard for ecosystem risk assessment. It provides a systematic framework for compiling information on ecosystems, including descriptions, maps, and uh, trend-based indicators on uh, ecosystem area and integrity. And it uses this information to assess their relative risk of collapse based on change in ecosystem area and integrity. And it does this over uh, several timeframes, the last 50 years, and then over historical time uh, timeframes, but also uh, can project change into the future. And one of the things that makes it different from the Red List of Species is that it does focus much more heavily on these trend-based uh, criteria uh, and, and indicators. So similar to the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, quantitative criteria used uh, to assign ecosystems to risk categories based on, um, on this quantitative information. Uh, and these risk categories, um, uh, for example, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable, um, but we have collapsed, replacing um, extinct that is used for species. And then from this, um, we can have a national red list of ecosystems. So, for example, this is um, this is from the the results from the South African National Assessment in 2018, um, which can be mapped to show where threatened species, threatened ecosystems exist. Uh, and then we can also develop summary statistics about which realms, biomes, or ecosystem functional groups are more threatened. So, the actual headline indicator. Um, um, or uh, A1 is uh, that the countries will report is a red list index of ecosystems, which summarizes the risk status across sets of ecosystem types based on the proportion of ecosystems in each red list category. So it's calculated in a similar way to headline indicator A3, the red list index of species survival, and it can be interpreted in a comparable way. So the, the, the headline indicator uses the outcomes of Red List of Ecosystems assessments, ideally at national scales, but data from subnational sub assessments, for example, states or provinces within a country, or above national assessments, like regional or global assessments, can also be used um, once validated um, and evaluated by countries. So parties should report on the number of ecosystem types per risk category in each ecosystem functional groups, uh, and I'll show you what this looks like in a moment. And the indicator will be calculated from these data or, or can be calculated from these data for, for both for countries and globally. And we will provide um, uh, reporting templates and a means of calculating the indicator for, sub for countries to submit. So what does this look like? Here I've got the example from Colombia. Um, this is based on their National Red List of Ecosystems Assessment um, that was uh, developed as in a partnership that included universities, the government institutes and NGOs, uh, and that was published in uh, a few years ago, I think 2018 or 2019. Um, this is a mock-up of what the, the reporting data would look like, but we're still developing the reporting template. But basically, we have the different ecosystem functional groups and the different red list risk categories here. And this is simply the number of ecosystem types that fall into each of these categories from each ecosystem functional group. So we're still drawing on this national data of different ecosystem types and how threatened they are. From these data, we can also calculate um, the red list index values here. So we have an overall red list index, index value uh, for all ecosystem types, and then for each, for each ecosystem functional group as well. This can also be shown in a, um, in a, in a graphical form to, to help tease that apart uh, as a sort of a summary statistic um, 
uh, that can support analysis. Uh, and what this um, what this shows us is not just the overall risk category, but we can understand how different types of ecosystem, different groups of ecosystem have different threat patterns. So for example, what we can see here is that tropical subtropical dry forests are very threatened, much more so than lowland rainforests, which we hear a lot more about. And this is largely uh, due to very high loss in the area of these ecosystems, up to 90% of the original distribution of, uh, low, of these dry forests have been cleared. So we see that they're all critically endangered, uh, all seven dry, uh, dry, rain, dry forest um, uh, ecosystem types are, are threatened. And basically you can just see them as tiny red dots in this map because um, that's, that's all that's left. Uh, we can also use the red list index for e of ecosystems to compare between countries. Um, so here uh, we have a graph showing the data from a continental assessment of the temper temperate and tropical forests of the Americas. Um, and you can show this graphically. Sorry about the quality of the image hasn't come out very well, um, where more we have a red list value, uh, red list index value per country, um, where the greener countries have fewer threatened forest ecosystem types than the orange. And then as um, as we develop these data and more, um, more assessments have done, um, then we can develop time series. So in South Africa, for example, they've already undertaken their third national biodiversity assessment, which includes ecosystem assessments. And this is just a, a preliminary red list index of ecosystems for the terrestrial ecosystems of South Africa. Uh, so in black, we have the overall um, red list index of ecosystems and in the background in colours different ecosystem functional groups and what we see is a, a steady decline towards um, increased risk or more threatened ecosystems. So where are data available for national reporting for the red list of ecosystems? Um, over 60 countries have all the test terrestrial ecosystems assessed with a subsets of terrestrial ecosystems, for example, um, Forests, in the example I just showed before, available in a further approximately 30 countries. Um, and um, on the slide there, I've, I've listed those for freshwater and, and marine ecosystems as well. We also have other countries um, that are underway or starting, such as Malaysia and Namibia. Um, so some of those um, countries shown in red here, where all ecosystems in the country have been assessed. Um, the assessments in some cases were led by governments, for example, in South Africa, oops, sorry about that. South Africa, um, uh, Norway and Finland. Um, in, um, in other cases, they were led by NGOs in partnerships with government, for example, Mozambique and Western Indian Ocean coral reefs, which we'll hear about in a moment, uh, and also in Myanmar. Um, and in other cases, for example, um, some of the assessments, um, the, the regional assessments in the Americas were done largely independently of government um, by NGOs or researchers. And these sorts of assessments would need validation by countries um, uh, before you, they're used in national reporting. These white gaps tell us where investment is needed, uh, most likely in ecosystem mapping and classification, as well as red list of ecosystems assessments. Um, and um, and so we still clearly have a lot of work to do. Um, but one of the things that we've been working towards is improving uh, our tool, our set of tools to support national red list of ecosystems assessments. Uh, so, for example, we have um, a, a website which provides the main portal for accessing all this information that is on this page and, and more. We have a, a preliminary database which holds about um, uh, 500 of the approximately 4,000 ecosystems that have been assessed. Um, probably with one of the most important rules um, is the guideline uh, resources, sorry, is the uh, guidelines um, for the application of the red list of ecosystems categories and criteria. We have a new version of that um, coming out um, in the coming months uh, uh, with an update. Um, we also have uh, various free and open online courses uh, that are available for anyone to use um, and to access, including uh, a MOOC on the, uh, a free open online course on the FutureLearn platform, 
which has had about 7,000 people enrolled so far, um, and an IUCN um, uh, training on the, on the IUCN Academy, uh, which provides more in-depth and technical training. And we have a range of web-based tools and code and apps uh, that, that people can use to support their assessment. At the moment, um, one of our priorities within the Red List of Ecosystems team is to support, is to develop a range of uh, resources that can support national reporting. And these range from reporting templates and tools for calculating um, the Red List index of ecosystems, uh, but also making those some of those um, data that are not developed by countries available for national reporting, uh, along with guidelines for national validation and quality testing. Um, and finally, um, seeking to, to develop and build um, our um, regional hubs and focal points um, around the world to support countries. So I just want to um, conclude by, um, by saying that e ecosystems are, uh, are really key to achieving the, top, the goals and the targets of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, we need information about ecosystems, where they are, and their change in area and integrity, um, which also provides a foundation for the information that's needed to implement the targets and the actions needed to achieve the goals. Uh, for example, we need this um, ecosystem maps and descriptions to design ecologically representative protected areas uh, when we're planning restoration, uh, what to restore and where. Um, and so actions for ecosystems are really going to be a, a key part of the targets and all of this data is going to be essential for measuring progress towards the global biodiversity framework through its monitoring framework. So it's clear that investing in foundational ecosystem classification and maps at the national level uh, is key to the GBF implementation and monitoring and that these need to be aligned to the global ecosystem typology to allow global comparability and coherence across the GBF uh, and its indicators. Um, A1 Red List of Ecosystems allows to understand how threatened different ecosystems are and how that's changing over time. Um, and this complements the suite of ecosystem, <coughs> ecosystem indicators. Um, and finally, I think what um, we're very aware of is that um, ecosystem reporting for all parties uh, at a national level is going to require investment by countries, but also by international organisations and the community. We need to increase national capacity and support um, for national implementation, which is going to be key um, to the success of the Global Biodiversity Framework and its monitoring framework. And on that note, I'm going to um, finish up um, and run only a little bit over time, my apologies, and move on to our panellists. It's great. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Jana now. Um, please go ahead, Jana, and I'll try and answer some of the questions while Jana Thank is you. speaking. Thanks, Emily. If you wouldn't mind just advancing into my slides. So my name is Jana Gilakian. I'm with the group on earth observations that's uh, convened multi-partner initiatives to develop the global ecosystems atlas um, this is an initiative and we can go into the next slide um, it's as i said it's a multi-partner initiative um, in close collaboration with the iucn get team um, emily's presentation pretty much uh, laid out why information about uh, ecosystems is important, critical in fact, uh, for achieving um, the goals of the GPF. But I have highlighted them again here on this slide and I realize actually I have missed um, indicators 2.1 and um, A2.1 and B2.1, but nonetheless, um, um, information about ecosystem extent, condition and risk really will underpin sort of a wide range of initiatives and applications that will be key towards uh, implementation of the GBF. I've also included Target 15, which is really aimed at uh, private sector um, implementation because, and it's a good thing that even through the multiple emerging um, frameworks for disclosing the um, nature risks, the 
alignment with GBF is really being pursued and therefore a uh, get aligned map of ecosystem extent and then condition will also be serving the needs of the businesses and the financial institutions, thus really allowing both the public sector and the private sector to really employ comparable um, approaches and methods to monitoring, reporting and accounting for ecosystems. Um, so the need is pretty clear here, and so the solution from where we stand, it's um, ought to be a trusted, comprehensive, harmonized map of the world's ecosystems that provides affordable, accurate, and up-to-date information on ecosystems that is harmonized to the international standard that is the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology, GET. Um, and supports country engagement and development of national GET ecosystem maps. Next slide, please. Um, one um, distinguishing characteristics of um, the Global Ecosystems Atlas Initiative is actually the integration of the top-down and bottom-up efforts. Um, the development of the Atlas will involve collection and spatial integration of existing data and newly acquire data from remote sensing technologies and modeling. So that's the top down um, aspect of it, as well as engaging with national actors to develop national maps of ecosystems based on the get. And this, especially um, in countries with um, low or limited capacities um, in um, the Atlas Initiative will support embedding the work of mapping ecosystems in national institutions. Um, currently, thanks to some seed funding from two donors from the government of the UK and UNEP, we have kicked off a proof of concept phase. And in this phase, we will complete the first um, synthesis map or this harmonized map of different ecosystem types distributed over different um, areas. It will be a collection, like I said, spatial integration of global, regional and national high quality vetted quality assured maps uh, that will produce this Atlas data product that is the synthesis map, as well as a web application that will serve up um, this data product to the users and demonstrate a limited set of functionalities and analysis um, that will be um, relevant to very specific use cases. Um, for capacity development for that national map building exercise, we're in fact kicking things off with the country of Maldives um, because this will build on the efforts of the IUCN um, GET team that in fact did some groundwork in the Maldives and established um, the framework uh, uh, classified the ecosystems of the Maldives by GET. Um, next slide. So the product of the Atlas uh, will be the base map. Um, this base map, as we, I said earlier, will underpin a very broad range of downstream initiatives that require um, a base map um, for, for those applications. And in Emily's presentation, we heard that well, Red List Ecosystem is certainly one of those applications uh, that will require a base map of ecosystem extent and then also ecosystem change. Um, it's um, It will be the most current um, information on the distribution of ecosystems that will be updated frequently and use the best available data. Um, its quality will be assured with several layers of data that will underpin, there will be hidden layers of data. And this will be the um, data freshness um, data layer that will give the information on when the data was produced, data richness layer, when multiple ecosystems are mapped for one location, as well as any change layers, the monitoring products and condition products that can show degradation. The base map, however, will be one single data layer with a single timestamp. And very important to note, each pixel, each location on this um, map will be assigned to a get type 
using a new coded system. This will be uh, best available data in terms of freshness, alignment to get resolution and accuracy. And as I mentioned, our proof of concept will be just a strictly limited in scope uh, minimum viable product that we intend to produce for COP20, um, sorry, for COP16 um, this October. Next. Um, I pretty much covered this, and as I spoke to the previous slide, this really just shows the various layers. Yep, yeah. and um, just to, in the interest of time, to speak a little bit about that uh, capacity development that was just on that blue one. Yep, that's the one. Um, for the work with the countries, the in-country work that we are planning, um, first of all, the development in this proof of concept phase of a synthesis map is going to result in a set of protocols and standards for how to crosswalk uh, existing maps of ecosystems to the get in order to produce a synthesis map. Um, the work in country is going to be based on several phases, um, ultimately producing a wall-to-wall -wall map of ecosystem types, with spatial data, metadata, and accompanying material. It will go through different phases from actually defining the classification of those ecosystems at the country level by IUCN GET, and then data discovery, uh, discovering all the data that already exists within various ministries, et cetera, identifying data gaps, and then using remote sensing and modeling techniques to apply that uh, on top of any data that will be collected in the field to produce those new maps. These new maps will then be built into the atlas in order to grow the atlas and improve its quality over time. Um, really one important um, value add of this initiative is in fact going to be in our pulling out all the relevant ecosystem data into the open domain in order to really serve the common benefit um, for the restoration um, of nature. And the um, obviously the spirit um, of this in-country work is to work to ensure that this project is embedded in national institutions and really develops a sense of ownership by the national actors. Again, uh, based on the work in the Maldives, we will produce a documentation and methodology for countries to map their IUCN GET national classification maps. Um, and then the actual work on scaling the implementation with the countries will be done not just by GEO alone, but only in partnership with other, um, through a whole network of organizations really, including the GKSSB and the future uh, regional, sub-regional, scientific, technical support centers and other partner organizations who are conducting um, work uh, within countries. I think this is all I wanted to cover super quickly. Um, and if, should there be any time remaining, I'll be happy to take questions. But I know we are running out of time. Terrific. Thanks so much, Yana. And I think you really highlighted the need um, for partnerships and that we're um, thankfully so many people working together towards a, uh, a common goal here because it, it, there's a lot of work to be done. But I think we're well on the way. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to move ahead with the speakers. Um, and um, Jana, thank you for staying up so late. And uh, um, if there's any questions in the chat that you might want to try and answer, um, or we can um, pull those out and discuss them at the very end. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Kendall Jones now, who's from the Wildlife Conservation Society, and we'll talk about um, applying the Red List of Ecosystems and Typology um, in Mozambique. Thanks. Kendall, and I'll try and do a better job of um, wrangling the slides than I did for poor Yana. Confusing. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'll try to be quick. Uh, you can go ahead, Emily, to the next one. Um, I want to give a, yeah, a very brief overview of the, the process of the Red List of Ecosystems in Mozambique and how it's being used to uh, inform environmental planning and GBF implementation in the country. So we've at WCS been leading a comprehensive ecosystem mapping and red list of ecosystems assessment at the national scale for Mozambique. 
it's aligned with the global ecosystem typology, which we've found a really useful tool to both inform the mapping and the development of the ecosystem map, as well as obviously facilitating GBF reporting, like Emily has has mentioned, as well as giving us regional consistencies so that we can cross stitch the maps from neighboring countries to do regional assessments. And it's forming informing uh, conservation planning and environmental decision making across Mozambique in a number of ways. Uh, which I'll get into a bit later. Next slide. So a little bit about the actual process, um, which I think is important to go over. This has been led by us at the Wildlife Conservation Society, but it's been in really close collaboration with the government throughout, with their environment department um, <clears throat> and some other departments as well. And that department is also responsible for developing the NBSAPs, so having that tight link with them is really important for for um, ensuring that the results can be used to inform their GBF planning and implementation. At the very outset, we established a national red list working group um, that consisted of government, civil society and academic partners. We had regular workshops, feedback sessions, project review meetings with that red list working group, and I think that was really essential both in order to make sure that the, the product that we produced was as robust as possible and made use of all the available data that we could get and also just ensured government ownership and investment into the into the process and the product, which is really useful for then getting uptake and, and sort of um, having them interested in using the, the product at the end. Um, they're now engaged in the final review of the red list and hopefully that'll be finished soon and then it'll it'll be basically officially adopted by the government of Mozambique as their as their national ecosystem map and red list results. Next slide. In terms of the kind of technical ecosystem mapping and how it aligns with the global ecosystem typology in Mozambique we worked with that national red list working group to do a, a deep data review of existing mapping products that exist for the country, we actually came across a a bunch of really interesting maps that were produced in like the 1950s and 60s and 70s, which were actually really robust and useful. And so we kind of used those as a as a basis and a framework by which we mapped ecosystems across the country. We then did a bunch of technical refinement using more advanced modern kind of techniques with environmental predictive variables and machine learning. We then undertook a comprehensive expert review of that ecosystem map with an online platform where people could add observations and make corrections and suggestions. So that went out for a comprehensive review to all the experts in the country and across the sort of Southern Africa region. And then finally, at the end, we did a crosswalk with the global ecosystem typology um, for use in the red list of ecosystems and to ensure that we can use it to inform GBF monitoring and planning. And also because some of the other countries in that region, like South Africa and Malawi, have done their ecosystem red lists using the GET as well. We're now able to crosswalk those typologies across the borders. Some of those ecosystems cover more than one country. So we're then able to do regional assessments for those ecosystems as well. So that's been really powerful um, through the GET. Okay, next slide. Uh, a quick summary of the results. Um, you can see the map on the left showing you the different ecosystem threat statuses. In general, we found 52% of the ecosystems were threatened in some way. Um, majority of that was along the coastal belt, alongside the central west of the country. And then the figure on the right shows you the ecosystem functional group level, which is the level at which we're looking to report into the GBF. Um, and like the other countries that Emily presented on, you can see that the impacts are really not uh, not homogenous. They're kind of um, restricted to some ecosystems which are really impacted, like subhuman grasslands and tussock savannas, and then other ecosystems like salt marshes, intertidal forests are doing a lot better. Um, next slide. In terms of how it's informing conservation in the country, um, obviously, the results of the red list can go directly into reporting on headline indicator A1 for the GBF. And I've put up an example there of the red list index of ecosystems for each ecosystem functional group. Um, once Mozambique's government officially kind of endorses this red list assessment, we're hoping that that's the kind of results that they can use to report on uh, goal A under the GBF. 
It's also being used to identify KBAs, ecosystem KBAs in particular, as well as inform potential protected area expansion. Uh, and it's central to Mozambique's biodiversity offset legislation as well, where ecosystem threat status has a has an impact on um, whether or not developments will be approved and what the compensation requirements would be. Um, and as I said before, the use of the GET is facilitating regional assessments within South Africa, Malawi, and also Namibia. So it's been a really powerful tool for us in Mozambique. Um, and I think that should give you a, a pretty good overview of what we've been doing and why it's been really useful. Um, happy to take any questions afterwards if there are. Thanks. You're on mute, Emily. Yeah, You're speaking. Sorry. It's a complete amateur hour here. Um, <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Kendo. That was really, really helpful. Um, I'm going to pass on um, uh, quickly to Michelle Goodka, um, who will um, talk about uh, another Redis of Ecosystems assessment, um, this time for marine ecosystem. Um, uh in um in in the same neighborhood um uh in the western indian ocean uh and and i'll come back to you um kendall for for questions um i'm sure and, and comments um michelle are you good to go yeah thanks Emily. um yeah so as Emily mentioned i'll talk about the red list of ecosystems assessment of uh, tropical coral reefs in the western indian ocean so that's covering an area of of East and Southern Africa, uh, as well as the islands adjacent to that. Um, yeah, Emily, next slide, please. Yeah, so this, I mean, this work was really spearheaded by an NGO based in Kenya uh, called Cordio East Africa, uh, really helped spearhead the project. And then it was regional involvement from research and government institutions. Um, so the key result we found, so what coral reefs of the Western Indian Ocean were vulnerable to collapse and we split the uh, reefs into ecoregions. So I think we had 11 ecoregions overall and we were able to assess eco each ecoregion individ individually, uh, finding that four ecoregions were vulnerable, three ecoregions were endangered and four were critically endangered. So yeah, not so positive. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, and then just talking a little bit about the process. So we had, so the process, like I said, involved a number of different stakeholders, mainly researchers and experts uh, on coral reefs, as well as government institutions involved in the management of coral reefs. Um, so we got them together, and this was from across, across the region. So we brought them all together in two workshops, one at the start of the process to introduce the Red List of Ecosystems and to train to train the different groups and then one at the end of the, the process to validate the results. Um, and yeah, we did that two, through two workshops. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so one of the purposes of bringing everyone together was to, to try and bring together uh, the data. Um, and so the data that was used, uh, Emily, is there a slide that was before this? Maybe not. Um, Uh, anyway, so the the data that was used, um, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, the data that was used uh, involved, so there's four different criteria that were assessed uh, for this ecosystem. And so the data that uh, was used was spatial data that was from global mapping processes, as well as um, projections on global temperatures into the future and in situ ecological data that's been collected through monitoring programs that have been established over the last 30 years from across the region. Um, and so that was mainly for Criterion B, looking at biotic change uh, in, eco, uh, in coral reefs over the last 50 years. And so these are just an example here on the right of the different indicators that were used. Um, so look at different aspects of the ecosystem's functioning. And like I said, that's been collected at various monitoring sites over the past 30 years by different programs. Um, Next slide. Yeah, and here's just an example of kind of the breadth of that contribution. So most of this um, was coordinated under the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. So a monitoring, a network of 
uh, experts that have been um, using established and standardized methods. Um, so you can see this huge list of contributors from across the region. So a real collaborative effort um, and a really good example of data sharing and collaboration from across the region that enabled this um, extensive uh, region-wide assessment and a consistent assessment as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, and just to touch briefly, so we did this regional assessment and then kind of as next steps, we wanted to see how these regional assessments can be used to inform national scale uh, planning and management and subnational scale. Uh, so if you just press the next slide, we took this regional assessment and the data that was used and we've now started to apply it at local scale using Kenya as a case study, as the first case study to see how we can kind of disaggregate that data spatially. Uh, and use it to inform uh, localized or finer scale management um, and decision making. So really trying to show the power that the data and inputs and indicators that are used in a red list of ecosystem can be used um, nationally, regionally, as well as locally. Uh, next slide. And that's um, all really, you know, this is some examples here, photos of some of the local engagement that's been happening in Kenya, trying to engage with community groups that are uh, have lo locally established protected areas as well as national management MPA uh, um, authorities as well. So, you know, really trying to uh, to use those finer scale results uh, and take it back to those communities that are in charge of managing and explaining to them uh, kind of what these results mean and getting feedback on, on whether that's really how they perceive their ecosystems and yeah, that really a uh, two-way kind of dialogue has been really interesting and we're just getting started with that so hopefully there'll be further discussions um, and greater uptake of of those results as well but yeah uh yeah that's kind of all i wanted to talk to you about or all i have time to talk to you about today terrific thanks michelle i'm just gonna um so hopefully stop sharing now and um we'll have time for um about five minutes of a panel discussion if there's any questions. Um, I wasn't able to see them until now, but um, I'm just going to quickly run through. I've got quite a few. Um, are there any that have jumped out to any of, to Yana, uh, Kendall or Michelle as ones that you would like to respond to initially? Hi, Emily. And I'm, I'm so glad that we, we have time because for some reason my chat is deactivated. So, Juliana, my apologies. I'm reading your questions, but I'm not able to type. And um, first and foremost, I did forget to mention that we have planned for a side event um, at Substa in Nairobi where we can go into a little bit more detail. And it's good to read these questions because we'll be sure to cover these also um, proactively during the side event. On uh, Juliana's first question about reporting data freshness and age in metadata, indeed, there will be structure method. Um, that's one of the aims of this proof of concept phase is actually to develop the protocol and the method for reporting that. So that will be shared then, um, hopefully at COP16 um, during the unveiling of the results of this phase. Over to you, Emily. Uh, yeah, I was just going to have a um, have a uh, try and answer Gary's um, question around crosswalking and how that works. Um, uh, so there's a range of different approaches that can be used for for crosswalking. At the moment, it's been um, uh, 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 different groups doing it in slightly different ways, and we're in the process of developing some initial, um, I guess, conceptual guidelines to try and help guide that process um, with it, within the next couple of months and a view to to developing more technical guidelines, hopefully by COP16, um, just to make it uh, clearer what the pathway forward is. But fundamentally, um, you're, you're looking at the different classifications, for example, at a national level um, with the typology uh, and using um, a combination of uh, predominantly expert um, uh, judgment, but also um, you can, we can be using that can be informed by uh, quantitative data and spatial overlap as well uh, to understand the key processes that link a national ecosystem type or the features of that ecosystem, the attributes of that ecosystem with the, the, the broader um, class of ecosystem functional group. Uh, and so I showed the example of the savannas there um, where 
uh, even though they they can be quite different in their structure, their function is really similar. Um, and so that means that they all belong to that ecosystem functional group of savanna because they're grass and fire dominated in their dynamics. And that's the case with um, with with all these different ecosystem functional groups. Those detailed um, descriptions um, are on the website and a conceptual model can guide that process. Uh, we do find that there tends not to be a perfect fit. Sometimes um, uh, it's not one to one, definitely not one to one. It's um, rarely perfect, you know, many to many uh, because classifications are made for different reasons. And so you would not expect them to fit perfectly. So actually, firstly, you need an assessment, a judgment about whether um, you should be trying to crosswalk these these because uh, two classifications, because they might just have such different purposes, such as a land use map and um, and, a, and an ecosystem map that they're not going to fit together all that well. Uh, so I hope that helps us briefly answer that question. Um, I can uh, take a, a quick one at Dave's question. Hi, Dave. Um, I think, as I understand it, reporting on A2 focuses on the the like the extent or area of natural or semi-natural ecosystems and doesn't get into ecological integrity of those systems. But ecological integrity criteria are part of the red list, which goes into indicator A1. So from our perspective in Mozambique, we found that it, it was really important to consider those integrity criteria because it pulls out a lot of systems that wouldn't come out as threatened if you just looked at extent. But there is quite a lot of widespread degradation across those systems. So it's really important, I think, when you're doing red list assessments for A1, that you try to incorporate the integrity criteria as much as you can so that you're not just thinking about ecosystem extent or um, restricted distribution systems, but also looking at integrity as well. Thanks. So I think <clears throat> maybe we we should wrap up and I would think people for joining and the questions. And um, I'll also take Dave's comment as a way to conclude. The, the monitoring system really, or the monitoring framework should be seen as a set of indicators. So each indicator on its own is only going to tell you a bit. So as you pointed out, the indicator on natural ecosystem extent um, tells you a piece of the puzzle and the indicator on restoration. And Emily had a slide early on that shows sort of how a number of the indicators fit together. And so I think that it is really important that we all um, work together to, to make sure that we're actually able to, to measure things consistently across the different indicators so that we have a better picture of biodiversity moving forward. And this is why we're having all of these different webinars is to try to explain the different methodologies on the different indicators so that um, it provides a basis for understanding how we're measuring different things and how these things all fit together. So I encourage you to, to join us for the future webinars. The one in about 12 hours will be on pesticides um, and so this is the applied toxicity uh, indicator that is in the framework. And so um, feel free to join us tomorrow. And thank you to the panelists as well. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Yeah, thanks. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye.